Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, very first Project Divert webinar. My name is Nusuke and I'm the director of the Flemish Peace Institute. Um, we, will discuss, we will be discussing the diversion of uh, firearms within the EU with a specific focus on non-regularized firearms. Um, why are we doing this? Well, because illicit firearms trafficking in uh, the European Union uh, generally involves weapons which were diverted at one point during their often very long life cycle. Uh, and there are many potential points of diversion. Um, and this is, of course, is a problem since we've seen that such diverted firearms have been used in criminal acts and terrorist acts across Europe in the last uh, several years. And uh, the, the prevention of uh, firearms diversion is one of the key priorities of uh, the European Union, also in its uh, recent EU action plan on firearms trafficking. And therefore, uh, we started Project Divert, which is a, a research project funded by the European Union um, and which focuses on three specific methods of diversion, uh, on firearms theft, on fraud uh, to acquire or possess or keep firearms, uh, but also on uh, non-regularization. And uh, today we will focus on this last uh, type of diversion uh, with an analysis of uh, diversion of firearms, components, and ammunition uh, through uh, armed conflict legacies, uh, illegal inheritance, and uh, as a result of regulatory changes uh, within the European Union. Now, this project is, is really a cooperation between, uh, on the one hand, the research community, and on the other hand, the law enforcement community. Um, so I would like to uh, start by thanking our partners. Uh, first of all, CIPRI, uh, who we did the research with, uh, archivist solutions, but also the, the law enforcement operational partners that have really been very helpful in um, undertaking this, this important project. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, the Guardia Civil, Europol and the Belgian Federal Police for all of their assistance in the last two years. Now, today we will focus on these non-regularized firearms and, and during this webinar, experts from archivist solutions, from the Guardia Civil and from the Flemish Peace Institute will try to answer as many the possible questions that you might have with regards to non-regularized firearms. Um, today, we will also be launching our report on this specific topic, uh, which will be available on our website uh, afterwards. Um, now, if you would like to mention this uh, webinar on social media, uh, you can always use our hashtag, which is uh, Project Divert. And if you would like to ask questions, we really would be uh, happy to, to receive them from you, from the audience. Um, so you can pass them on to us by uh, clicking on the, the, the Q&A button on the uh, lower end of your screen. Uh, and that way uh, we can see them popping up and we can answer them uh, during this webinar. Um, if you see a question which you think is very relevant, uh, you can also uh, like it. You can use a thumbs up to uh, score it a bit higher. Then we know that this is really something uh, that is uh, very relevant to you uh, as an audience. Now, uh, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Matteo Dressler, who is a researcher at the Flemish Peace Institute. Uh, Matteo, can you please tell us uh, more about the scope and the characteristics of uh, non-regularized firearms in Europe? Yes, uh, thank you, Niels. I'll first start by uh, sharing my PowerPoint before I get started. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint? Perfect. Um, okay, so I will walk you uh, through some of the main findings um, of our research on non-regularization, which is one of the diversion uh, methods used uh, in, in Europe, as uh, Niels has pointed out, and one of the three we have looked at in depth in uh, Project Divert. Here again, you can see um, also the cover of the report, which is uh, published today, which you can find on our website, so you can check it out um, after, uh, after this um, webinar today. Um, I'm gonna walk you through a bit first of answering the question, what is non-regularization? And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the types we have identified, the types of uh, non-regularization which lead to firearms diversion in Europe, the scope of uh, firearms non-regularization in the EU. And I'm gonna conclude on uh, a bit of an outlook of how we can still improve the intelligence picture. Uh, uh, on firearms non-regularization. Let me start on explaining a little bit what non-regularization is. So non-regularization is a process in which firearms, ammunition or firearms components should have undergone a legal regularization. So we're talking about a legalization process 
but they have not. Um, so we have studied three types, how such non-regularization can occur. So we're talking about legacy of armed conflicts or significant political transition, which can lead to non-regularization. We are talking about changes in the legislation, which can cause it and also the inheritance of firearms. Uh, one thing which um, stands out uh, on, on the diversion methods of non-regularization is that it is a rather passive act. So often people don't do something and therefore divert the firearms. So imagine, for example, a citizen who just does not register his arm after there's a change in the in the, regu uh, in the, in the, in the in new regulation, firearms regulation. So and that distinguishes it a, lo a lot from other diversion methods such, uh, such as fraud or theft, which of course people need a lot more criminal energy for, if you will, to divert um, a firearm. Um, I'm going to start uh, with the first um, type of non regularization which we have looked in, into death. And these are the conflict legacy firearms in the European Union. <clears throat> and as you are probably all aware, there is a couple of reasons why there is an increase on influx of, of, of firearms into society during armed conflict. So you're talking about the procurement of um, arms by state or rebel forces civilians purchasing firearms during conflict to protect themselves, but also weapons which are captured from battlefields. And after the conflict, that of course leads to a, a quite risky situation that these firearms will not be regularized because often post-conflict scenarios contexts are quite um, yeah, disorderly. Um, and we have a couple of, of examples where this type of non-regularization occurs in Europe, which we found. First off, um, the Western Balkan, which is probably the most well-known and also most mediatized case of a legacy firearms in the European Union, especially because those are known to be trafficked also across the EU, something uh, uh, our colleague Paul from Archivist, Archivist Solution will also talk a bit more about later. Um, so the, the reasons for non-regularization during the, the, the conflicts in the Western Balkan was that many uh, soldiers deserted in, in the end of the conflict but also that the state, um, some uh, state firearms were passed on to uh, local rebel forces. And lastly, that there was not immediately a rigidly implemented firearms regulation in place. We looked a bit closer at this phenomena in, in the case study of Croatia, which was one of eight countries we studied more on deaths. And there we found that citizens, for example, clung on to their weapons for various reasons after the war. So first off, um, <clears throat> personal attachment to the weapon can be a reason to, to just keep it and not regularize it after war, but also the monetary value. For example, citizens who have purchased weapons during the war to protect themselves don't just want to give them away. But lastly, of course, also personal security as a reason. And we know, for example, for Croatia, that till today, these legacy firearms um, are make up the biggest share by far of illicitly possessed uh, firearms in the country. And it's also those firearms which are used mostly in gun crimes in the country. Um, another um, conflict legacy for, of a more recent uh, conflict uh, we see in, in, in Northern Ireland. There is assumed that um, after the, the civil conflict, the troubles ended in the late 90s. Um, that not all firearms uh, were uh, surrendered by the, the warring forces. And that means, for example, today that in Northern Ireland, police still fr frequently seizes, like also military grade uh, firearms, such as AK-47 patent rifles. And that is very different, for example, from the rest of the UK, where these firearms are rarely encountered. Um, a bit of an older conflict legacy, which is, however, very widespread across the EU are firearms which are still held from the First and Second World War. Um, those are still encountered today in multiple countries and seizures. They are also handled in during uh, collection measures or found on battlegrounds, which suggests that they are still held by citizens uh, up to this day. Reasons of keeping them after the war are similar to those reasons which I mentioned for the Western Balkan, for example, emotional attachment, but, but also the lack of control after the war of weapons. And we know also that in some member states, such as Denmark, for example, they are still uh, widely used by, by criminals, um, which, of course, also shows you a bit of the public safety perspective that this, this um, method of non regularization opens up. Now, I want to briefly touch upon one specific um, methods, how these firearms are still newly acquired, if you will, by citizens today, and that is um, through digging them up. So at the end of the war, um, many of these firearms were often left behind on battlefields, were dug into the soil while fleeing or even thrown into lakes and sealed boxes while retreating. 
And this is a picture you see here is, for example, by the Latvian police force who has uh, found these firearms with a group of collectors who were specialized um, with going with metal detectors over old battlegrounds to, to unearth these, these type of firearms. And another example is, for example, from Austria, where, where it is known that um, some of uh, the, the mountain lakes in the, the region of Carintha um, still hold large boxes of sealed uh, firearms, which some divers have specialized in trying to, to, to get uh, from, from the lake. <clears throat> Um, another, uh, there's also two other um, uh, older conflicts which we encountered, which still um, uh, make up a, a share of illicit possession in countries. So, for example, the Spanish Civil War, weapons are still encountered in Spain and in Cyprus. Also, various conflict uh, legacy still um, make up some of the illicit possession in the in the country. <clears throat> so. Political transition can lead to a similar uh, problem as armed conflicts and that they, of course, also often lead to uh, a disorderly transition. Um, so, for example, it is known that uh, during the end of the Cold War, um, firearms were handed over from retreating Russian soldiers to um, citizen and organized crime groups to uh, in, in, in Eastern and Central uh, European member states of the European Union, and that these these firearms are still also still held to a degree today. <clears throat> and yeah, what is perhaps also interesting to look at is the types of firearms we are talking about here. You see it a little bit also on the picture. So compared to other diversion method, it is especially um, pertinent to to point out that it is also uh, military grade firearms, which are um, um yeah diverted in these through these type of legacies and machine and submachine guns but also partly hand grenades so that is very different from other diversion methods um which we're gonna um talk about in a minute <clears throat> then um there's also a couple of conflicts which are still going on which might also lead to a future influx of legacy uh, firearms into the european union uh, here it is especially important to point out um, Ukraine, where it is known that uh, a couple of millions uh, of firearms are proliferating in the country. Currently, they are still mostly proliferating in the country because there is a demand for firearms, of course, because of the ongoing conflict. However, should this conflict at some point calm down or end, there's, of course, a risk that, that this demand diminishes and that those firearms are also at risk to um, being trafficked um, to uh, the rest of the EU. <clears throat> Here you have a, a little overview map basically of what I told you just now. So you see, for example, um, uh, Croatia. So I'm, I've only highlighted those countries in the European Union. You see, for example, Croatia with uh, Balkan conflict legacies. You see in red, for example, so Soviet legacy firearms. You see uh, in, in orange and those countries which have some other type of transitions or older conflicts and conflict legacies and in dotted. And the dots indicate, uh, for example, where we have observed black digging of World War weapons. I've refrained from coloring all instances where we have found uh, evidence of Second World War uh, possession, because then probably the whole map would be colored. So after having talked about conflict legacies, we will now turn our attention to um, the second non-regularization method, which we have looked at in depth, and these are law changes. So during law changes to uh, the firearms regulation, these uh, changes often stipulate new rules on who can own firearms under which conditions. And during these changes, a non-regularization can occur mostly for two reasons. First, intentionally, if somebody who has to regularize or yeah, adhere to new rules just decides, I don't want to do that, I want to keep my weapon. And second, also unintentionally, if somebody is, for example, not fully aware of the new uh, legislation and therefore keeps um, their weapons. Um, there's a couple of um, uh, changes to the regulation which we found to be especially prone to uh, cause non regularization So first off, um, the reclassification of live firing firearms. So for example, when weapons either change from freely available to some type of registration or authorization, uh, but it can also of course mean, of course mean that uh, some uh, weapons become fully prohibited. Uh, one example here which we found is the overhaul of the firearms authorization system in Belgium in 2006, uh, where many different types of firearms needed to be reclassified and therefore also newly regularized, if you will. And law enforcement experts assume that 10,000 of these firearms were actually not correctly uh, regularized after this law changed. 
and people actually decided to, to keep them, so to say, illicitly. Um, it is also um, assumed that this is making up one of the biggest share of illicit uh, possession in, in Belgium today. <clears throat> Another uh, type of change which is prone to non-regularization, which we have observed, is um, new rules for blank firing guns. So, for example, in Lithuania, in 2011, there was a change to the legislation that um, uh, alarm pistols need to be uh, authorized by the police. And there was a three-year transition period to do that, to acquire such um, authorization. But even after 2014, when this uh, transition period ended, authorities still assume that uh, quite a significant amount of uh, firearms or um, blank firing guns are still possessed without being authorized. And this poses a, a particular risk in this case because it, because it is known by Lithuanian authorities that these firearms are a target for criminals to be uh, converted uh, to live firing firearms. So again, this opens up also a public safety perspective here on, on, on non-regularization. Um, a third um, change in the regularization which, which uh, can cause problems is uh, new rules for firearms de deactivation. So um, the European Union, as many of you will know, has set out new standards for deactivating firearms. What that means is basically to take away the, uh, the capacity of a firearm for live fire. And these standards have been updated uh, multiple times. And one central issue accompanying these changes was especially for dealers who are specialized, uh, legal dealers, which are specialized in, in, in selling these guns that um, it is quite costly to update them to the new deactivation standards from the old deactivation standard, and also that these uh, firearms uh, tend to be less um, popular with, with customers these days. Um, and for example, in Spain, we know of one case that, uh, where Spanish law enforcement uh, uh, agencies have busted the network of legal dealers in 2017. And these, these legal dealers allegedly sold uh, deactivated firearms, which were still deactivated by old standards after the law change. And it is also known that some of them ended up in the criminal scene in Spain. <clears throat> There's also this, this problem will also not go away in the future necessarily. For example, there were new rules uh, by the, the, the uh, your uh, firearms directive set out on acoustic expansion firearms and uh, member states are still partly implementing them now, I have recently implemented them. And here again, the issue is that in, ma in many countries where this uh, law change is now implemented to register these type of weapons, they have never been registered before, which means it is rather easy for somebody who wants to not stick to the new rules to just keep that weapon because authorities often have no records of them. So this is basically a, a problem which is not, not going away anytime soon. <clears throat> so in addition to uh, the problem with law changes and conflict uh, legacies, we have also looked at inheritance causing a non-regularization. And we can think of inheritance uh, causing non-regularization in two ways. The first way is um, inheriting a legal firearm, but uh, not regularizing it. Usually in many countries, one has the chance to put an inherited uh, firearm on uh, an existing license or to hand it over to authorities to be destroyed or to be deactivated. So if people do not stick to that rules, there's a risk that uh, they get non-regularized. The second dimension concerns those firearms which are passed on between generations illicitly. So illicit weapons which are passed on here, we're not strictly talking about diversion per se. So often these firearms have been diverted in the past. Think for example about the second world war weapon, but they're then passed on to the next generation. So here the illicit status of the farm is rather sustained than yeah, that it is a new illicit status of a firearm. And the type of firearms concerned here are often specific to the national context. So all firearms which are held legally or illegally in a specific um, a national context will be, so, will be those which are non-regularized through inheritance. So we are talking, for example, about hunting and uh, other rifles, shotguns, handguns, and to a lesser extent, we have found evidence um, on, on military-grade firearms being illicitly inherited. And here on the side, you see, for example, um, a seizure of French authorities that concerns an uh, illicitly inherited collection uh, of, of firearms. That brings me uh, to the scope of non-regularization. Um, First off, uh, one must say that the, the information, the scope of non-regularization primarily rests on expert estimates. So we have hard, robust statistical evidence on how big the phenomena is. Why do we have this problem? We think there's two reasons. 
first of all, as the title of our report also suggests, these are in, in many ways forgotten or hidden weapons. So it is just very hard to quantify a problem which is per se rather hidden. Second problem is also, of course, that not all firearms which are seized are always um, analyzed and traced systematically for their point of diversion by law enforcement uh, authorities in Europe, which of course makes it hard to establish if these firearms were diverted through non regularization That being said, we found a couple of cases um, where police seizures were actually um, distinguishing for certain non regularization methods, but those were the exception. For example, in Latvia, it is known that in 2015, more than 700 firearms were seized and the police reported that about 50 of them were the product of past wars and black digging. In Poland, uh, similarly, the police reported in 2009 that about 40% of all seized firearms could be traced back uh, to, to black digging, which also already gives you an idea of, of how big the issue of non regularization really is in these countries. That being said, um, that brings us to our findings. In general, we can say that non-regularization seems to account for an important share of illicit possession in a significant number of, of member states. And we estimate that a couple of million of these firearms are currently illegally held in the EU. Most of these firearms we found are held by uh, citizens, not criminals. However, that doesn't mean that these firearms do not end up in criminal circles. As I had mentioned before, for example, in Denmark, sec Second World War firearms are still circulating in criminal circles. We, we talked about Spain and Lithuania with risks of um, firearms, which underwent a law change ending up in criminal changes. And then, of course, which we will hear also later by our colleague Paul, the, 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 the issue of um, Western Balkan firearms being trafficked across the EU. Um, and a couple of more points on the scope. Some of the most populous um, state in, in, in Europe seem to have uh, really big problems with non-regularized firearms. So we're talking, for example, about Germany, which had problems with law changes causing non-regularization uh, back in the 1970s, Spain, um, and also we have talked already about Poland um, with, with issues of black digging. So that suggests also that these are really quite big numbers since some of the bigger states uh, when it comes to population have problems with non regularization <clears throat> As we have also discussed earlier, states uh, have problems with different methods. So some type of conflict legacy is probably present in almost all uh, EU member states. Like for example, the Second World War weapons, other legacies as we discussed are very specific to national or, or, or regional um, 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 places. <clears throat> and it is much harder to, to estimate actually how in how far law changes in inheritance, how, how big the problem is there, because there's simply a lack of information on, on, on these problems. So we have evidence on a couple of countries where law changes have led to big problems with non regularizations but we, we simply don't have that information on, on many member states. So it is, it, it is a bit unknown how, how big the scope is there exactly, and the same is true um, for inheritance. <clears throat> which brings me uh, to my concluding slide, and which asks how we can generate more intelligence. First off, what have we learned through our research on this um, issue? We have learned a lot about, about the modus operandi of non regularizations We know quite well how it occurs, when it occurs, in which context it occurs. We have a general idea of the scope, meaning that we know that it is a, a relevant, quite sizable problem. That being said, we have little hard qualitative ed evidence on, on the problem in terms of how many firearms does it really concern. We have also identified a couple of good practices to generate um, more intelligence on the topic. Uh, one uh, big, big thing here is analyzing seized firearms for their point of diversion more systematically. Um, also considering, of course, sources of non-regularization while analyzing them. Um, then it's especially pertinent to also systematically trace those firearms used in crimes to specifically look at, specifically look where those firearms which are used in crimes are diverted in order to stop these diversion sources of course it is important to assess law changes um, for their risks of non-regularization before they are implemented but also monitor while they're implemented where is their risk for non-regularization what can be changed and it is also important to gain a better understanding um, of, of the problem of inheritance, for example, by anonymous citizen surveys to find out how big is the problem actually, how many people actually own uh, illicit firearms, 
which uh, are non-regularized to uh, inheritance and um, what, what are they doing for that with them, for example, as well. So we hope that this uh, report and also this presentation uh, ha has contributed a lot to the intelligence picture. But of course, this intelligence picture, uh, we also hope that it can be used um, and improved and used for um, yeah, forming the basis for future operational and strategic actions to tackle non-regularization to prevent that um, non-regularized firearms also end up in the wrong hands and in the worst case scenario are even used uh, to commit commit gun, gun crime. This is really uh, what should be avoided. And with that, um, I will hand it back to my colleague Niels and I'm looking forward to answer some questions uh, later on. Thank you, Matteo, for your presentation on the scope and the characteristics of, of this problem of non-regularized firearms in the EU. Um, as, as Matteo already mentioned, there's of course also a, a problem with the trafficking uh, of these weapons. Uh, these weapons are being bought and sold uh, and trafficked across Europe. Um, with us today, we have Paul James from Archibus Solutions, uh, which has also been a very, uh, very good partner in our project, contributing to the findings that we will be presenting today. Uh, and James will talk a bit more about uh, the illicit trafficking of non-regularized firearms uh, from his perspective. So Paul, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Niels, and good morning, everybody. Uh, once again, it's a real pleasure to be given the opportunity to present uh, on such an important topic. I'm going to talk about two specific elements of the research that we did. Uh, we were lucky enough to uh, do the work uh, for this study on all of the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. Um, and I'm going to talk about the situation there and some links from Lithuania to trafficking in the UK, which I was actually involved in myself. But I just want to give you a bit of a feel for the, the Baltic states generally. Um, I must say that um, the, the, the cooperation we had from all the agencies and individuals across uh, all of them were absolutely fantastic. And there was a large degree of similarity across the three countries, although they all have their own unique characteristics. Um, broadly, Lithuania and Estonia uh, have quite low levels of uh, illicit firearms and a relatively inactive market. But in Latvia, the situation is slightly more different and uh, definitely more active. But there is a, a real degree of commonality uh, in non regularized firearms uh, across all of them in respect of inherited and hidden firearms being a regular a regular phenomenon being found in houses being found in basements that was something which was consistent across them all but the thing that's really stunning and i think from a research perspective is the massive steps forward that all three states have taken since independence from soviet occupation in early 1990s because the broad situation across all of them now is that levels of um of, of, of firearms crime and certainly, again, the issues around the, the, the thing that we're talking about today is very low, whereas in the early 1990s, it was very widespread. There were a lot of non-regulated firearms in possession of the public. Um, when we were talking to the Estonian Security Service about this, they explained that just prior to independence being granted, uh, a large number of military trade grade guns were sold by the Soviet armed forces to local criminals and to Russian organised crime groups. Um, and although this was originally believed to be the result of corrupt Soviet officers, um, the belief uh, was, was formulated that it was a systematic practice to sell firearms to Russian friendly actors. And um, this led to a, a rise in all levels of crime and non regular, certainly possession of non regulated weapons in the 90s. But the way over the last 20, 25, five years that these countries have actually developed systems of registration and removed the non-regulated weapons from the marketplace is really good practice um, and it's led to a, a situation where there are generally very low levels of, of, of non-regulated firearms in, in possession of the public. However, Latvia is a slightly different situation. Um, they have quite a large and a, a very significant problem due to historic firearms. Um, due to the fact that the Latvia, unfortunately, was the location of several very substantial battles in World War II, uh, which is not the situation in Lithuania or Estonia. And this has led to a phenomenon known as, as black digging. Uh, this is probably the most significant source of illegal firearms in Latvia. Uh, 
most notably um, through the illegal excavation and possession of these firearms from the old battlefield sites. Um, and as I've mentioned, there were a number of very large scale battles in Latvia during World War II. Um, probably the biggest was the Battle of Courland, which lasted almost a year between July 1944 and May 1945. Um, and to give you some idea of the scale of the battle, it's estimated that there were probably 150,000 casualties on both sides, both Soviet and German. Um, and after the war, the, there was a, a very broad area with a huge amount of military style weapons left. Now, this has been exploited um, since then by individuals um, in, two, in two respects, either for individual interest as collectors or criminality to get access to these military grade firearms. Uh, and it, it's really interesting because you think after the passage of time that if you were to, to recover these firearms now, what sort of state would they be in? But many of them have been preserved very well, and many of them are certainly still capable of being fired, which means that it is a real issue. Uh, the, the police in Latvia believe that hundreds of cases of black digging happen every year, uh, and accounts between 30 to 40 percent of the number of seized weapons and firearms related cases in that country every year. Uh, and as Matteo mentioned in his presentation, the example was a, a case in 2015 where of the 720 firearms removed from circulation as non-regulated weapons, over 50% of them were the products of black digging, which is a very substantive proportion, obviously. Um, and again, another operation in 2015, uh, there was a specific operation where they seized over 70 firearms, 3,000 pieces of ammunition, and these were machine guns. They were submachine guns. They were assault rifles, really serious guns. Um, and th these were recovered by the police targeting people who'd been involved in black digging. Um, the MO is fairly simple for this because the location of the old battle sites are very well known. They're frequently marked on maps, which are readily available. So with access to these maps uh, and a metal detector, it makes it fairly easy to find these firearms. Uh, and also there's been a growth over recent times in online forums where they share in information about where the black digging sites are and the type of weapons that can be found there. Uh, and the use of the, the internet and social media and things is in common with a lot of law enforcement issues at the moment. Um, there's also evidence of firearms being recovered by black digging being sold online uh, and through the dark net which means that it, it actually is a really considerable problem. And the, the non-regularization of this is, is not unique to Latvia, as, as, as Matteo said, but I think it's one of the, the, the best case studies that, that we could give of, of, of a really big issue that does need to be addressed, because although there's limited evidence at the moment of black digging firearms being supplied and used in criminals routinely, there is definitely the potential for diversion uh, and also, I think, innocent collectors who may well have collections who look to sell them in good faith could be exploited by criminals. And I believe that's happening as well. So the numbers in circulation are substantial anyway, but there's a risk that I really don't think can be underestimated. So that's one element of the, 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 the situation. The other one uh, directly around trafficking looks at Lithuania. Um, and I know from my personal experience, because I was a police officer in the United Kingdom in the, in the 2000s and 2010s, when the biggest problem we had uh, as far as gun crime was the, uh, the, the blank firing weapons that were being brought into the country from Lithuania. And they, they were the source country for so much of it because uh, the, the weapons being used were Russian made bicycles, which could have been bought very cheaply uh, in Lithuania. They were being converted, so to, they were able to fire live rounds in Lithuania and supplied to the United Kingdom in kits where basically a silencer, a gun, ammunition were wrapped in a bag, wrapped in oil to destroy forensic evidence and brought into the country on a very large scale. And the UK authorities worked with the Lithuanian authorities to address this problem and it, on two fronts. One from a law enforcement perspective, we sourced the gun factory, the conversion factories in Lithuania, we closed them down, but there was a very significant change in legislation in Lithuania in 2011, which required the registration of alarm weapons. Um, and there was a period up to 2013 for that to take place. Uh, and the good news is that 50,000 alarm weapons have been registered, 
but the legacy of 20 years of free circulation of these weapons means there are many still in circulation, um, probably in their unconverted format, because what we are now seeing in the United Kingdom is these bike weapons still coming into the country, still coming from Lithuania, but not in a converted state. And we've recovered and discovered a number of conversion factories in the United Kingdom where we've actually found these weapons still coming in, but actually being converted here in the UK. It was a really good example, both from a law enforcement perspective, as I said, but also from a, a legislative perspective to address this issue. Um, but uh, I think the issue of readily convertible firearms, broadly as illustrated by the BICOR, um, is a, still a very real issue for a lot of countries. And I'll very quickly give you an example of a, a case study that I was directly involved with uh, when I was the head of Navis in the UK back in uh, 2009 was a, a blank firing weapon, a starting gun called the Olympic BBM. Um, and this was basically used as a, a starting gun at race events and things like this. Uh, but the criminals had found it was really easy to convert, uh, to be adapted so that it could actually fire nine millimeter rounds. Uh, and between 2007 and 2009, uh, almost 200 of these were recovered by the police, having been used in a variety of crimes, including attempted murders, serious ro uh, uh, robberies, grievous bodily harm. And in fact, it was the most commonly used handgun by criminal gangs, the youth gangs, the street gangs in London at that time. Um, so we had a problem here. We had a gun, but there was no regulation on it whatsoever, being the most problematical firearm. And this is an example of where really good focused intelligence uh, such as uh, firearms focal points that are being developed to, across Europe at the moment help to establish when a new trend develops. So we were able to commission independent testing of the Olympic BBM um, and using the test in the UK, forensic scientists were able to establish that it could be deemed as being what was classified as a readily convertible firearm. And, and the test in the UK is based on two elements. Firstly, any gun that could be so converted without any special skill on the part of the person converting it. And if it doesn't require equipment or tools other than such that they're in common use by persons carrying out work of construction and maintenance in their own homes. So having done the test with the Olympic BBM and deemed it to be readily convertible, the legal status of that firearm was changed overnight from being completely unregulated to what is classified in the UK as a a Section 5 prohibited weapon, a handgun, because our handgun laws are very straight, uh, very strict, which meant that just straightforward possession of that gun left people liable to a potential five year prison sentence. And the practicalities of that is that we had to address this issue with a lot of people who had innocently purchased these firearms as blank firearms were now in possession of guns which carried a, a very heavy penalty for possession of them. Um, so we worked in a very coordinated program of activity, working with sports shooting organizations, the gun trade, uh, with a three-pronged strategy, stopping the importation at source, withdrawing the product from uh, circulation uh, through the gun, gun dealers, and a targeted amnesty, where we worked hand in hand on a very high profile publicity campaign. Uh, and we recovered off the the 1500 weapons that we think were in circulation over 800 during the course of that amnesty uh, and the criminal use from these firearms these unregulated firearms were was stopped overnight olympic bbms just weren't an issue but this is a situation that often occurs when a, a black firing gun is, is categorized as being readily convertible um, and this needs to be regulated once it's been once it's been classified as such but it leaves that this really dark area of a number of firearms in circulation which are gone from being needing no classification at all to actually being needing very strict regulation and a really important lesson I think that that has been learned and certainly from the research shows is that it's really important that proactively focused activity is taken to try and remove those firearms from circulation so I hope that helps it's just two specific instances from the research that we found around the black digging uh, predominantly in Latvia, but also the issue of uh, unregulated firearms, the effect of a change in legislation in Lithuania, the impact that had in the UK, and also the issue of conversion of blank uh, firing weapons. So uh, in a very limited time scale, I, I just hope that's been of some interest and uh, 
I, I think the the, the whole find, the findings of Dever, as outlined by Mattio, are, are very important for us as we consider the issue on, on a larger scale. So thank you very much. No, thank you, Paul, for your insightful presentation um, and those very specific examples that, that show us what can go wrong with these types of weapons. Now, while uh, Matteo and Paul were talking, we already received a couple of questions uh, through the Q&A function that I would like to pose to, to both Matteo and, and, and Paul. Uh, maybe the first one is, is very specific to Matteo. Uh, could you please explain what uh, decorative firearms uh, uh, mean for you? Uh, and then also a second question, follow-up question is, uh, what is the role of weapon parts trades in this business? Uh, so Matteo, let me start with those questions for you. Yes, um, so decorative for firearms is uh, perhaps a, a term I borrowed too much from our uh, index case study in Germany. So basically, a uh, more commonly used word for these firearms would be basically replica or imitation guns. So it's basically guns which closely resemble, look like a live firing firearms, but are not not a, a live firing firearm. I think that that answers the, the question quite quickly. Um, the second uh, question was um, on parts, um, on the trade of parts. I can say little about the trade per se. It is, of course, um, the case, as, as Paul has also mentioned, that especially those firearms which are dug up um, by collectors, that they often need to be uh, refurbished to make them live firing again, if that is the aim by the collector. So there um, one can, of course, see that also parts might need to be replaced to, to kind of refurbish them. So this is definitely um, where, where parts, uh, farm parts also play a role, but perhaps um, also Niels can, can add a little bit on that or Paul on the issue specifically on the trade of, of these things. Uh, I, I think I think from my perspective, um, obviously a lot of the focus that we've been looking at with this is the unregulated nature of them. So um, obviously the, the very fact that things are unregulated means that there's no, obviously uh, very, very often a very little restriction on the trade across it. That changes, I think, when you cross the barrier into live firearms, live firearms parts. Um, but I, I don't think it can add too much more to what, what, what Matteo has actually said on that one other than that. No, thank you, Paul and Matteo. And maybe I can add something as well from the experience here in Belgium is where uh, a couple of years ago, the legislation changed um, and um, the magazines for the firearms are actually now uh, need, requires a, an authorization as well, uh, which was not the case previously. And um, we have seen that there has been, for example, a, a collection, a program also for these, these magazines, uh, but very little have actually been uh, handed in. And this, I think, raises a question uh, which is connected to what Paul was saying as well, that if these, if these components were not uh, required to be registered before, it's, of course, very tempting not to regularize them when the legislation changes. And it's very difficult for law enforcement uh, agencies to actually detect them and try to uh, take them out of society. Uh, so I think it is a very important question that we, that we need to have a bit more attention for. Um, I would like to, to jump to another question which came in, uh, which I think is more for you, Paul, uh, which is also about um, the weapons, the post-Soviet weapons. Um, uh, uh, let me read it quickly. At CSEC, we regularly register uh, seizures or voluntary submissions of non-regularized firearms and ammunition remaining from the former post-Soviet conflict, such as the Transnistrian War. And there are occasional reports from the Moldovian police seizing uh, small arms and light weapons possibly coming from the Transnistria region. I wonder whether some of those firearms end up from the non-EU post-Soviet area to the EU, uh, for example, through Romania or another EU member state. Do you have any uh, estimate or ID whether this is really something significant enough to keep track of? Now, it's a, a long question, but I, I hope, Paul, you have uh, an ID. Yeah, I mean, we, we've done a huge amount with CSAC and, uh, yeah, really good to see them involved and they, they do a great job with the, the monitoring of weapons from there. Um, I think, yes, I think the answer is, my, my, my understanding of this would be yes. Um, I, you know, we've definitely seen examples from areas uh, such as Romania uh, and, and so on that actually do get trafficked. Uh, and I, I think the answer to the question, I, I do think it is significant enough to, to keep track of, um, but probably not to the level that we do see from other countries um, down in the Western Balkans at the moment. Thank you, Paul. Matteo, do you want to add something uh, to that question? 
Yeah, I, I think that um, that also one one uh, issue is that um, other sources of uh, previous Soviet weapons, such as those which are still kept in Slovakia and have been deactivated into floorboard weapons, into acoustic firearms, that those firearms from the, the uh, post-Soviet space, if you will, receive a lot of, uh, of attention for good reasons uh, still. And maybe that's also why uh, less attention has, has been uh, paid to, to these issues. This is something uh, I could still add. Okay, thank you. Um, no, thank you both for, for the answers to the questions we've received. There, there's one more question, specifically more on legislation, which I would like to uh, deal with after the presentation of uh, Adriana and Maria, um, because we still have some time at the end of the webinar. Uh, so do not hesitate to send in more questions if you have them. Um, now it's time to move on to the law enforcement perspective. Um, Adriana, uh, you work, uh, well, you're the driver of Impact Firearms uh, that really stimulates a cooperation between national law enforcement agencies. Um, and Maria, you are the, with the Spanish uh, national focal point. Um, so I think very interesting perspectives that we can hear from you. Uh, can you both tell us a bit more on, on international and national law enforcement initiatives to combat uh, the trafficking of such uh, non-regularized firearms? Uh, Adriana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Niels. It's always a pleasure to be uh, involved and uh, to continue supporting the different initiatives that we have been developing together. So as you mentioned, I'm the MPAC Firearms driver and uh, from the MPAC Firearms, we have uh, actually uh, been working in a multidisciplinary uh, way and in a really comprehensive way uh, to be able to detect the different needs. And uh, definitely one of uh, the most relevant um, issues has been in relation uh, to the different um, implementations of the law at the international and national level. Uh, so I want just to share a really short uh, presentation uh, to go with uh, um, the words that I want to share with you. And then immediately I will give the floor uh, to Maria that as she is at the Spanish National Forums Focal Point also to explain uh, different developments in terms of uh, changes on the, the different legislations at national and international level to be able to uh, help the fight against the firearms trafficking. Uh, so you know that at the international level, one of these initiatives has been the EU policy cycle, and then there is one specific impact in relation to the firearms. And uh, what uh, this impact has is experts from the different um, uh, areas that uh, are needed to be able to tackle the firearms threat. One of them is the legal control, but it needs to be combined with investigations and also with uh, the different uh, challenges in terms of uh, the forensics. And with all of that, we are uh, uh, developing uh, activities uh, related to intelligence picture, operational support, capacity building, cooperation with our partners, and, uh, and uh, the rest of the things that you see on the screen. So thanks to that, we have been able to detect different threats that has just been explained by the previous speakers, so such as uh, the problem with the gas alarms and uh, the flowers, and uh, also with uh, the historical and the loss of stolen weapons. And we are targeting, uh, from a more strategic point of view, with the support, because this is um, a work that we are developing all together, member states, together with the agencies uh, and other uh, relevant stakeholders. So later on, after with the presentation with the commission, we have been working really close together. So there have been some developments already because of the threats that we have identified. So working all together, we have been able um, to develop many initiatives. So we have def uh, defined um, many different specific threats and uh, many of them that were linked also with uh, the uh, differences and discrepancies on the implementation of the different uh, pieces of legislation at international and uh, national level. And uh, the diversion is uh, obviously one of them, and we have been cooperating uh, with, uh, with um, the organizers of this uh, uh, seminar uh, today and the following days. So with the Flemish Peace of Institute in cooperation with the Project Divert and the Impact Forum. So um, this is uh, the introduction on what, uh, as an example, one of the national forums focal point, um, they have been detecting and developing um, because of a consequence of all these um, international uh, way of work. So I will give the floor now to the uh, captain Maria 
that um, she's um, working at the National Farms Focal Point, uh, where they have been uh, detecting and developing many uh, uh, changes in the legislation at national level because of all the threats that we have identified. So, Maria. Um, uh, I can share. So, good morning. So, I can share my uh, video. I don't know why. <laughs> Have a moment. So I don't know why I can share my video. So uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to try to share my presentation and I think it's okay. So uh, good morning. Uh, my name is, um, one moment. My name is uh, Maria Jimenez. I'm captain of the Warrior Civil, and um, I am. Um, one moment, one moment, please, because I have a problem. I don't know why. Can you uh, see my presentation about? Um, yes, we yes. can see everything you're doing with the PowerPoint. Okay, just the presentation. Uh, one moment, please. Okay, so uh, good morning. My name is Maria. I am captain of the Warrior Civil and I am assigned to the Spanish National Finance Focal Point. In this few minutes, I'm going to briefly explain the situation in Spain with respect to the main topic of today, the diversion of firearms. Uh, thanks to the thanks to the data uh, that we analyze every year at the National Farms Focal Point, we can estimate the number of firearms seized due to the commission of a crime, which come from diversion. Uh, this is possible because we try to analyze the trustability results uh, of these firearms. Uh, I have used data from the last two years as an example. Uh, as you can see uh, in the slide, in uh, 2019, we determined that over 62% of firearms seized were registered and seized for their legal owner. Therefore, the other 38% uh, of the firearms came from diversion because they were seized uh, from the illegal owner or even their origin uh, could not be determined. In the last year, uh, taking into account the effect of uh, COVID on criminality, around 7% of the firearms were seized from the legal owner. The rest, around 30% came from diversion. Uh, as I said, um, this data um, are from firearms related to a crime. Uh, however, uh, most of uh, the firearms uh, from the diversion are surrendered directly by the family of the owner to the competent authority or the civil when the owner passes away uh, as the weapon uh, were kept for personal defense or emotional reasons. So uh, in Spain, uh, some of the sources of uh, non-regularized -regular weapons are uh, the army. The army is responsible for controlling the weapons used for the personnel. Nevertheless, uh, during the 50s until the 70s, some of the weapons were not only the army uh, control any longer. Uh, presumably because uh, some of the register were lost. Uh, the consequence of that uh, was the most of those weapons were kept by the original owners without permission until they passed away. Um, in order to be able to recover the weapons uh, that are in similar situations, uh, the Spanish regulation set up the possibility of what we can call a permanent voluntary surrender uh, campaign, uh, meaning that uh, the family can hand over the weapon uh, without being uh, triggered for illegal possession or uh, punished by uh, any means. 
Uh, this is the same case that the Spanish war, the, uh, Spanish civil wars uh, weapons. Uh, gas alarm weapons, these kind of weapons are not firearms in origin, but uh, what we all have seen uh, is that every time that the traceability of a weapon is not ensured, it becomes a problem. Uh, the gas alarm weapons until uh, 2017, they were fully more or less sold in Spain. We uh, changed the regulation and now the owner must be authorized. And in any case, the traceability of the weapon is ensured. Uh, in order to uh, be able to regularize the previous uh, weapons, a massive coordinated action took place on all the agents through the country went to the stores uh, to get the personal information of the previous buyers. After that, a campaign of, another campaign of surrender regulations uh, took place. But uh, still, uh, there are plenty of gas alarm weapons to be regularized. Uh, these are the most important situations, although uh, there are a great variety of cases. Uh, for example, uh, antique firearms, which are regulated in a different way in other countries, and also the activated firearms about uh, which spine modified the regulation to harder measures of the activation. Uh, thanks to uh, our experience, uh, we have learned that criminals take advantage of any legal uh, loopholes. So the strongest tool to combat diversion is to increase uh, restrictions and controls, of course. And the best tool as a law enforcement agency is traceability investigation, not only to know the origin of a specific firearms, but also to know the current situation of each country and uh, new trends. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Adriana, for your presentation. Um, now let's move on uh, to the next presentation, which is actually my own presentation, specifically focusing on the several EU and national initiatives that have been uh, taken in, in recent uh, years in order to, to tackle this problem of, uh, of non-regularized firearms. Um, let me start my slideshow here as well. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, several of these initiatives have been taken in recent years. I'm not gonna be able to, of course, uh, talk about all of them in the 10 minutes that I have during this webinar, um, but please uh, check out our, our report where we have, of course, uh, much more time to, to write stuff in and have much more of our findings elaborated on. Now, I will just focus on some of the key uh, initiatives uh, that I think are very well worth mentioning. Um, now, first, let me start with the EU. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, the, this is really a priority for the EU, uh, safeguarding the illicit market and, and preventing diversion, but also trying to, building, trying to build a better intelligence picture because we, we know that uh, this, this is a problem, but we know not enough uh, to really focus on the problem and be able to deal with it in a very effective way. Um, so what the EU has been doing is, is actually been... Uh, trying to improve this intelligence picture in, in various ways uh, by, by supporting actions to uh, increase uh, good uh, data collection, uh, firearm strafing, tra tracing, as Maria was said, is, is being stimulated, but also information exchange, for example, through the impact uh, platform. So I think these are all of the, the, the issues that the EU is really trying to, to, to push. Um, but when you look at it from a researcher perspective, it's also interesting to see that um, several of uh, previous research projects that have been funded by the EU have also focused on, on diversion. Uh, projects like EFFECT, uh, FIRE and SAFETY have all analyzed uh, firearms diversion within the EU and, and the trafficking, especially of conflict legacy weapons. Um, now with Project Divert, we're actually doing the very first uh, project specifically focusing on non-regularized firearms, uh, as well as firearms thefts and, and fraud. 
Um, so this is the first time we really have this explicit research focus on non-regularized firearms as a, as, a, as a whole in Europe. Um, as I mentioned before, and Adriana was saying, of course, the EU is also supporting impact firearms, uh, which I think is a very important platform to be able to really consolidate and strengthen connections between national or enforcement agencies, for example, for setting up uh, joint operations and, and, and really operational information exchange. Now, what I would like to focus on today is maybe uh, look specifically at these conflict legacy weapons. And, and the EU is doing uh, several things on that. But I think very importantly, of course, is it looks at the source countries and the source regions and tries to work with partners uh, in these regions uh, in order to solve the problems there as well. And the EU has been supporting uh, CSEC uh, for, for, very, for many years now uh, with all the work that they've been doing in, in really trying to uh, getting the situation under control with regard to, to legal possession, legal trade, but also the illicit possession and illicit traffic of firearms. And I think a very important uh, step there uh, that has been taken is this roadmap that was developed in 2018 um, to really tackle illegal possession, misuse and trafficking. And one of the key uh, priorities uh, in, in uh, this roadmap is actually uh, decreasing the illicit possession in the Western Balkans. Uh, which is, of course, very largely connected to the armed conflict uh, of the 1990s there. And ways in, in which uh, the roadmap stipulates in doing this is, for example, uh, by organizing collection, voluntary surrender uh, campaigns, uh, possibilities for uh, legalization, for regularizing firearms um, from illicit possession. Uh, but also, for example, by focusing on good deactivation procedures um, and, and having enough time to, to be able to register, uh, re-register your firearm after a change of legislation. I think these are all very tangible actions that, that really can make a difference uh, with regard to the situation in the Western Balkans, uh, which is of course an important source region for trafficking into the EU as well. Um, but uh, as was mentioned by Matteo, it's not just the Western Balkans that people are, are worried about. Uh, we're also looking at other potential future source regions like Ukraine, uh, like uh, Middle East and North Africa. And e uh, there as well, we see that as part of the EU small arms and light weapons strategy, um, external action service is also uh, supporting uh, various initiatives to strengthen cooperation with the countries in Middle East, North Africa, and with Ukraine as well, trying to set up a, a good information exchange um, so that we can try to avoid some of the problems that maybe uh, arose uh, from the Western Balkans uh, previously. Now, um, these are some of the issues specifically from the EU with regard to conflict legacy weapons. Now, with regard to uh, non-regularization as a result of, of changes in the regulation, um, there are also some initiatives that I think are, are well worth mentioning. Um, and a first one, I think a very important one is, is the, the introduction of the so-called grandfathering clause. Um, as many of you know, the EU firearms directive was, was amended uh, in 2017. And one of the, the major changes and also one of the most controversial changes uh, was the, the reclassification of certain semi-automatic firearms uh, into a category A, which are prohibited firearms. Um, for example, uh, full automatic firearms that were converted into semi-automatic firearms, uh, but also uh, semi-automatic center fire uh, firearms uh, with uh, large loading capacity uh, were also uh, prohibited um, and um, also long semi-automatic firearms that could be uh, reduced in length to less than, than 60 centimeters without losing its operational functionality also became prohibited. So these new categories, categories A6, A7, and A8, um, yeah, it became much more difficult to acquire uh, these weapons. There's only a couple of exceptions that, that, are, that are allowed to be able to keep these weapons. Um, but what is interesting there is that the EU found a a compromise uh, with regard to this grandfathering clause, which basically states that people who possess these types of weapons, legally possess these types of weapons uh, before uh, 2017, uh, were actually allowed uh, to keep. Um, and so member states were allowed to renew or prolong uh, certain uh, authorizations to keep these weapons. And I think this is really uh, an important measure uh, that can help prevent uh, the the, the, the non-regularization of these weapons and, and these weapons diverting, disappearing into the illegal domain, especially since in many of these countries, 
um, the, 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 the registration of these firearms is not always uh, up to standards. So I think this is some of the issues that the EU has been taking. Um, but what we did in our project is also look specifically at national initiatives. Um, and, and a very important way that we did this is by actually developing a database of 102 identified cases of collection initiatives that were undertaken in Europe. Uh, so it's more than the EU in Europe uh, uh, between 1991 and 2019. And um, I think a very important distinction there that we need to make is between um, the weapon collection initiatives that were taken uh, in an immediate post-conflict context versus uh, weapons that uh, initiatives uh, that were taken in, in peacetime. And, and I think this is a very important uh, part of our research because um, we have seen studies in the past on collection measures and, and DDR programs across the world, but very little has really focused on Europe. Um, so we, we try to uh, collect information as much as possible on these 102 cases. And what you see in the immediate post-conflict uh, context is that very often uh, this, of course, happens uh, in the countries where we've seen conflict. So uh, Western Balkans and Northern Ireland is where we identified such uh, collection initiatives. And there you can make a distinction between uh, weapon uh, collection uh, policies and, and programs um, by commands uh, immediately after the conflict or at the end of the conflict, and then more voluntary uh, programs. Um, in peacetime context, this is quite different. Um, we, we, in our analysis, we made a distinction between, on the one hand, collection programs, which have uh, a determined time, um, or collection policies, which are uh, indefinite in time uh, and keep going on. Um, and what is interesting there is that this, really, um, this is really about voluntary participation. So it's not uh, by command. This is voluntary participation by civilian gun owners uh, where they hand in their gun uh, in exchange for an incentive. And usually this means uh, some form of amnesty uh, for, for example, illicit possession. And these uh, collection initiatives have been taken in, in very various contexts, which I will elaborate on in just a, a few minutes. Now, in our project, we really focused on these peacetime collection programs, um, which is, of course, the, the majority of, of the initiatives that we have identified. Um, uh, which really contained this amnesty provision. And we tried to look at the data, uh, which was mainly official governmental data on, um, for example, the, the characteristics of the, the programs and the policies, but also, for example, on uh, the number of weapons collected or regularized. Um, we also drew heavily on, for example, reports from international and regional organizations uh, that these countries uh, are part of. Now, Despite our effort, this is of course still a very difficult endeavor. And the main problem there is that not always uh, the data is very well collected, uh, which means that it's often very difficult to compare, for example, uh, numbers of collected firearms across Europe and say which one is now the most successful program uh, uh, compared to others. Now, when we look at these uh, initiatives uh, by, by member states, uh, on the one hand, we have the collection policies. Uh, as I said, they're, they're unlimited in time. And then on the other hand, we have collection programs, uh, which are limited in time. And within the collection programs, we made a distinction between three types of programs. On the one hand, very local programs, uh, and then national programs, either focused more on the removal of weapons out of society, or the regularization of weapons, uh, where people are allowed to, to keep the weapons as long as they uh, take a number of steps, for example, registering or asking for licenses for these weapons. Uh, in the next few minutes, I will just elaborate a little bit on the main findings there. And we look at collection policies. Uh, we, we've identified cases uh, mainly because uh, countries, mainly countries which have historic uh, possession rates of, of firearms. Uh, Estonia, Belarus with Soviet legacy weapons, uh, Croatia and Montenegro with, with armed conflict legacy weapons. But an interesting case is also Finland, uh, which has a very high history of, of uh, a history of high levels of, of gun possession um, in the country, um, which is uh, considered a risk, a risk of diversion, a risk of theft. A lot of firearms thefts uh, occur in the country. And therefore, um, uh, several activities have been undertaken to uh, try to uh, 
take these weapons uh, out and allow people to, to hand in weapons uh, uh, in a continuous phase. And interesting there is that between 2004 and 2010, in Finland, for example, more than 25,000 firearms have actually been handed in. Um, now, these types of collection policies, uh, unlimited in time, are usually organized at national level, and they usually have one incentive, which is basically an amnesty. Um, when you look more at the at time-limited collection measures, um, we have collected a lot of information and, and we can conclude that in total in these 20 years, uh, more than 650,000 firearms have been collected through these collection measures, which are mainly organized at national level. Um, and there are, there's quite some differences in, in the way these various collection measures have been organized. Um, first of all, uh, the, the length of, of such a, a measure uh, can vary very significantly. Uh, some uh, measures uh, are only two weeks, while we've also encountered initiatives which lasted more than a year. Uh, now, on average, uh, this is, it's very difficult to say what the connection is uh, to the number of collected firearms. Um, we have seen that longer programs do not necessarily lead to more collected firearms. Um, sometimes a short uh, length uh, is also very beneficial because people know that they, they only have a few weeks or a few months to hand in their guns. Uh, while the longer periods also sometimes involve people um, waiting until the end uh, to actually hand in uh, their uh, weapons. Now, not only the, the length is different and the way it's organized, but also the context in which these, these collection measures have been organized is different. Uh, most of the time, um, this is connected to change in legislation. Um, sometimes it's an armed legacy conflict, um, and we've also seen some um, campaigns that have started, for example, after a mass shoot. Um, and the incentive is also different. Um, most of the time, though, uh, we, we talk about partial amnesties. Um, some cases, uh, in some uh, cases, we've also seen blank amnesties. And blank amnesty is basically when there are no questions asked. Uh, when guns are handed in and we don't have to give your name, it's completely anonymous. Uh, nobody really does any ballistic testing. Um, these weapons are immediately destroyed, um, which is really a blank uh, amnesty. This is, this is not that common in Europe. Most of the time we talk about partial amnesties where um, firearms uh, are handed in and the people who hand in the firearms are uh, exempted for prosecution for certain uh, criminal acts, for example, there is a possession. Um, but if these weapons then uh, are, turn out to be used in criminal activities, that can still lead to certain uh, prosecutions and, and, and further criminal uh, investigations. Um, cash rewards have been used uh, in the past, but are very exceptional. Um, so this is some of the basic uh, characteristics of these collection measures. Now let's zoom in on these subtypes. Um, we identified eight um, local uh, programs. Um, there are probably much more, but it's very difficult to find enough uh, detailed information uh, to be able to include that in our database. Uh, but we've seen, for example, in the UK, uh, several examples, um, for example, in Manchester, where there was a, a shooting of a 15-year-old boy uh, about 15 years ago, which led to a, a local program, which uh, resulted in 430 firearms being handed in. Um, but we've also uh, uh, seen this later in Manchester as well, for example, in 2017, when they saw that crime was rising and there were uh, numerous cases of thefts of firearms, uh, which also resulted in a local program, which led to more than 200 firearms being handed in. So uh, smaller numbers, but uh, programs that can be very effective because they're very close to the community um, uh, where they take place. On average, these local programs last about two weeks, uh, involve partial amnesty. And um, as I mentioned, they, they're often connected to, to a crime context, to shooting or even a, a, a legacy of armed conflict. Most cases, however, uh, were national removal and national regularization programs. Um, national removal programs are generally uh, take place in countries where we see high numbers of non-regularized firearms. The different types uh, that Matteo mentioned previously, armed conflicts, uh, change in legislation, but also crime prevention and mainly involve partial amnesties. And the regularization, as we can expect, is often connected to changes in legislation as well. 
If we look at it from a regional perspective, uh, we see some differences. We see that in Eastern European countries, Soviet legacy uh, plays an important role uh, in these initiatives to collect weapons. Southeastern Europe, armed conflict legacy. And in Western Europe, we see mainly the context of crime prevention and, and new changes in legislation. Finally, uh, I would like to also mention some of the measures that have been undertaken, not just to collect or regularize firearms, but specifically inherited weapons. Uh, and Matteo said that this is also an issue uh, within, within Europe. Um, and, and made a difference between intentional, unintentional, non-regularization. I think some of the measures that we have identified and, and saw as best practices is, for example, trying to prevent intentional non-regularization by giving people the option to register their firearms on existing licenses or applying for new licenses. Um, people are often connected and emotionally attached to the weapons from their parents, their grandparents, and so on, and might not want to return the weapon. And then this is a way to do so. Another way to do so is, is having these weapons being deactivated. Uh, that way they can still be kept uh, by um, some of the people uh, that really want. Unintentional non-regularization uh, is basically is about people not knowing. Uh, what they need to do. And therefore, uh, one of the best practices that we identified is where um, really uh, well uh, thought of information campaigns are organized, uh, which provide clear answers to people about the different legal opportunities that they have, to, for example, to keep their firearm or to get rid of the firearm in a way that uh, doesn't do them any harm. But we also know that some people uh, don't uh, regularize their firearm because of a fear of punishment. Um, so then we also seen several procedures for found firearms where people can uh, uh, hand them over to the police because they found them several weeks or months after, for example, somebody deceased. And then finally, um, it, what is also important to keep in mind is when we have um, these changes in legislation, there are some things that we need to do in order to, to, to limit the risk of diversion. And first of all, it's, it's have a clear and targeted communication on these changes and the legal possibilities, as I mentioned before. But also, uh, which was mentioned earlier today, uh, keep good records of legally held firearms uh, because that ena enables people to trace weapons, enables people to actually follow up on what happens with these weapons. And finally, uh, what I also mentioned earlier, uh, like the grandfathering clause, we've seen this not only at the EU level, but also at national level, which I think is a very important way to try to prevent these diversion risks. Um, with this, I would like to end my own little presentation. Um, um, what I can say is please check out our website, our new report, where you can find much more information on uh, all of the stuff that we have just been talking about. And now I would like to go back to uh, my, my the speakers of today, because we still have a couple of questions that have uh, come up through the Q&A function. Um, let me uh, start with a question that was raised for you, Paul, um, about uh, gun registration. Uh, it's something that I mentioned just now as well. Um, do you think that it will become more prevalent in Europe, in the UK? Uh, was I, mean, that, that, I mean, I'm really grateful for Casey to ask in that question because it, it's, I think, probably one of the most important elements with all of this. Uh, and yeah, I feel very strongly about it. I mean, we, we've seen a load of the way that this works, I mean, I go further than saying a, a registration system. I think it's a firearms life cycle management system where the, you, you actually track the life cycle of the firearm from its origin, you know, from importation or manufacture right the way through to destruction. And that can only be done through effective registration systems and comprehensive registration systems. And that's where I think there is a big weakness. Uh, my experience shows me that there's very little joined up thinking about the best way to do this. And systems can run from very good and very complex systems in, in some places to still spreadsheets in others, which no way do the business. And I think as well, when you look at this particular thing of non-regularization and you take Lithuania, for example, where they decided to regulate the gas weapons that causes such a problem. Well, if you're gonna do that, you need to keep records of them. You need to understand the risk that's being imposed by them being diverted. And also you need to understand when they've been destroyed or removed from circulation so you can understand the whole issue. So I, I could talk forever about this. I, you know, maybe it's something we can, but if anybody would like to come back to me, because it's something that we've done a lot of work on. And I think it's definitely moving in the direction where we, do, we need to become more joined up. We need to come up with consistent standards about what registration systems do and indeed licensing systems 
but I think it's really relevant to the unregulation, the non-regulation issue that we talk about today. And, you know, we're talking about recommendations. That is one of the ones I would personally would put right at the top of the list. Thank you, Paul. Um, we also received another question um, and a comment uh, thanking us to emphasize, for emphasizing the public awareness and outreach on changes to national legislation as an important tool in tackling non-regularized firearms. From what we see in Southeastern Europe, there is often a lack of information among population in particular when a firearms re-registration or legalization process is ongoing. So I would like to maybe ask uh, Adriana and, and, and Maria if you can uh, answer this question as well. Uh, what, what, what is your opinion about um, information exchange and, and really awareness raising among the public on, on the campaigns that have been going on? <laughs> no, I wasn't really sure if it, Maria or Mia uh, we will answer, but um, internet exchange of information is really important. And to be able, when we do these uh, kind of campaigns, um, we, we there is always some concern, no, in relation to uh, how later on this information needs to be analyzed by law enforcement agencies, mm -hmm. and uh, then how do we treat the information? Uh, so. Um, yes, we definitely by our experience, um, at least also that, that we depend on national level, but from our experience in Spain, uh, we always check um, uh, firearms. So if some crime uh, could be uh, investigated, the investigations will will be developed. Uh, so there are different kinds of uh, campaigns that can uh, be um, developed. And this is uh, from our experience. But then every country have different ways of developing uh, these kind of campaigns, but they are really important uh, to be able to be shared and to be able also to, to share different experiences and so on. And also once uh, these firearms could be linked with other countries at the exchange of information with other countries, that's a must. Thank you. Can I just add very quickly to that? Yes, please. One, one of the things I think is really important, as well as, well as the very great point raised there, is I think it's got to be a partnership approach. Um, and what's worked really effectively, uh, I've seen on, on lots of cases, is where you work with the, the gun lobby, so to speak, the sports clubs, the shooting clubs, people like this, because they have great relationships with uh, their, 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 their owners. And sometimes they feel that law enforcement are targeting them and focusing them on and not doing it for a good reason. We very much find if you can get them on board and work with them and get them to understand the rationale and the reasons why it's really important to perhaps register a firearm uh, and bring it into legislation, they can work with them. And that's been one of the most effective things of any strand is not just the message needs to go out, but I often find that the, the people who actually represent people who own firearms legally, because nobody's looking to attack the people who are responsible with firearms, it's the illegal side of it. And I think if you can get their trust, they tend to work with you. And that's been really successful in getting registration and uh, removal of firearms that aren't. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe I can add something to that as well, because this is also something that we've seen uh, not only um, with the, the possibilities to regularize firearms, but also to collect firearms. I think there's a couple of steps that we need to take when you're planning and organizing such an event. And one of the key questions you have to ask yourself is who is your target group? Are we targeting criminals? Are we targeting uh, ordinary citizens? Are we, who, are, who are we targeting? Because we need to adapt our programs in function of that. Um, and I think this is connected to what Paul was saying, uh, where you can work with certain groups that, that definitely have a connection uh, with people. Uh, for example, not just sport shooters and clubs and so on, but also arms dealers, for example, can play an important role in providing information to everybody. So that it's clear what is possible, what they can be prosecuted for, what they cannot be prosecuted for, and so on. Uh, and this communication needs to be very clear and targeted. I think what's also important is that you not only communicate in advance, but also afterwards about the results of the campaign. Uh, how many firearms have been collected? What type of firearms? Uh, were they legally owned or illegally owned? And so on. Um, because this is something that people uh, often feel like is missing. Like you're expecting people to do something to take a risk, but they don't see the results. And I think this is very important to, to raise public awareness as well, is to, to really share that kind of information. Which also brings me to another point, which is um, at the end, you have to evaluate whether the program worked. 
or not? Um, was it successful or not? And this, of course, has to be done in light of the, the target group that you have in advance and the goal that you set yourself in advance. Um, but often we don't have enough detailed information that allows a very good evaluation of such programs. And therefore, it often it is very difficult to keep organizing them and finding political will to do so if, if you cannot really evaluate the previous uh, attempts that have been done. Um, I don't know if somebody else still wants to add something from the speakers. Um, otherwise, there's one more uh, comment, one more question, which is that um, it's very important uh, to actually involve uh, as many actors as possible in, in doing this, uh, trying to prevent diversion. And the question is, how is it possible to involve the academic community, politicians, civil society, and citizens to all work together on this? Uh, which is, of course, the, the million euro question. Um, maybe I'll, I'll go to Adriana first. Uh, how do you see this, this possibilities for working together? So obviously, I would say that uh, through MPAC, we are trying to do this. This is why we are cooperating with uh, uh, the researcher centers and law enforcement agencies and uh, all the other relevant stakeholders in relation to the firearms trafficking. This is the result of the work we are doing. Uh, we need to continue doing that. On theory, this is what it should be done. It's really complicated because it's not just national cooperation, coordination, it's also international coordination, but also is to be aware of who are all these relevant actors that in the area of firearms there is a huge amount of different um, project initiatives and uh, and you, you really need to be aware of all of that but uh, thanks to all these kind of initiatives we are starting to do um, better these um, really comprehensive way of working all together so I would say that that impact is an example and uh, we are really open uh, to continue and to increase our cooperation with other relevant stakeholders. Uh, but this is, again, as you said, a one million question. So I would say that at least now we have a mechanism in place in the EU that foster this kind of cooperation among all of us. Yes, and I would like to add, because it's, it's 11 o'clock, the time is ticking. I would just like to have some, some final uh, remark to add to that is that this project is really a collaboration between such partners. And I think this is, this is really an innovative way of doing so, is uh, working together between the research community and the law enforcement community. But we also made sure from the start that we also uh, involved uh, other governmental agencies, uh, customs organizations, export control agencies, domestic gun control agencies, trying to get them all on the same uh, page, trying to inf share information as much as possible. And the report that we will be launching today which is available on our website normally, um, is actually the result of this. And this is something that I really look forward to, to keep on doing this uh, with our partners. Um, I would like to end by saying, please go to our website, check out the report. If you have any more questions, comments, just let us know. Um, but just so you know, we also will be organizing two more webinars as part of Project Divert. Uh, we have one more webinar in the end of May uh, on firearms thefts and one more on the fraud with firearms at the end of June. Um, so I would like to welcome you all to go to the website. If you're interested, you can register there and you can find the reports there as well. With that, I would like to thank all of you, all of the speakers uh, for being here. Also, thank you, the audience, for all of your questions. And I hope to see uh, many of you soon again, hopefully in real life, but otherwise uh, digitally. So thank you all and have a nice day. Bye-bye.